and welcome. Thank you for joining me for this session of the IMPACT series. My name is Mary Lou, and I am the Professor of American Studies and History, and this lecture is titled Asian American Issues in the Pandemic Era. So as we've all seen in recent months, one of the biggest issues that has been the concern of Asian Americans and Asian American communities around the country has been the rise of anti-Asian violence as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Last month in particular, we saw a surge of vicious acts directed toward elderly Asian Americans that led to a huge public outcry and certainly a number of videos going viral on social media. The attacks were so horrendous that it was difficult to ignore them. And I think it really drew public attention to what had been happening to Asian Americans on the ground and particularly urban communities where large concentrations of Asian Americans um, live. So the attention, the concern, the outcry over anti-Asian violence really grew um, in these last few months and certainly in the last month. As we've seen, the res responses have been a wide range, condemning um, these horrific acts, as well as community efforts to address the problems. There's been calls for more policing and even voluntary efforts to um, create one's own community patrols, something that I think we haven't seen uh, or in the media anyway, uh, much about since for decades. Um, we can think about New York City during uh, the 80s and 90s in terms of the guardian angels, for example. So today's talk, I wanna discuss this concern along with how to think about social justice more broadly, as this is a moment in the nation's history where we're not just dealing with the problems of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's also a moment in the nation's history of what's been called a racial reckoning with the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others. So this is a very, very important time in the nation's history. And I think we have to pause and ask, where do Asian Americans fit in all of this? Where do Asian Americans fit in this moment of the pandemic crisis? Where do Asian Americans fit in the nation's racial reckoning? Indeed, I think we're living in a current moment of important discussions of race and social justice in so many areas. We're thinking about criminal justice, food and economic precarity, and public health to name just a few. So for today's conversation, we won't be able to cover all of these topics. Uh, we'll focus mostly on questions of race and disease and particularly how it has related to Asian Americans in the 19th and 20th century uh, and really think about what this means for the COVID-19 pandemic era. But that said, I do want us to think hard and about really broadly thinking about social movements, social justice and race. So let's begin. So I'm gonna take a second here and uh, put on my PowerPoint and we will get going. Okay. So I'm sure everyone has been following the news. Um, I mean, especially as we are all been quarantined, uh, put in physical distancing, you know, we're reading the news constantly and it would be hard to miss these headlines. Um, certainly as the pandemic was picking up speed and it was clear that it was making its way, uh, you know, towards other countries be, uh, beyond China. And we can see, um, for example, the media immediately picked up on President Donald Trump's unabashed use of racialized language to discuss the pandemic. So these are just some of the headlines from um, a few months ago um, where we can see this. Um, well, I guess it's been over a year actually. The Chinese virus, the Kung flu, to name just a few examples. We see so many journalists um, in 2019, 2020, quick to rise up and criticize and try to mitigate that kind of racializing language around the virus. And instead doing quite the opposite, um, being quite careful in their reporting to not just use things like the Kung flu, um, the Wuhan virus, et cetera, but instead to use the scientific name SARS-CoV-2 um, and the disease COVID-19 
to describe what was happening. But we also have seen that the linking of the disease with race and foreignness, uh, with Chinese-ness, is not, was not certainly not just something that we can attribute to just President Donald Trump or the political right, but, but instead was actually fairly common in terms of sort of almost normalizing that kind of association of race and disease. For example, um, we can see here that in and that and that in, it actually led to um, oh actually let me see here okay for example we'll come back to that other slide in a second but for example we can see here um, the the backlash that happened very quickly um, in January 2020 when University of California at Berkeley um, health officials were trying to be helpful in terms of creating a pamphlet that to distribute to uh, Cal students that said, you may be um, having all sorts of normal reactions to the concerns about the disease, about the pandemic. So here you can see some of the things that were listed were social withdrawal, difficulty concentrating and sleeping, hypervigilance to your health and body, anger. And then at the end, xenophobia, fears about interaction, interacting with those who might be from Asia and guilt about these feelings. Well, so, you know, right away, many um, took um, issue with this because this was definitely not coming from a, a left political viewpoint or a right political viewpoint, but simply an effort to deal with public health concerns. And yet here we have um, this issue of xenophobia coming up as though it was somehow a normal physiological reaction along with or or um, or psychological reaction as a result of um, the stresses brought on by the disease. And as you can see here, um, you know, this, this one person, Dr. Glasner writes, as a proud Cal alum and Asian American, this is really truly unacceptable. Stop normalizing racism. And then here also, this is a study that was done um, that showed that really you can see these, these the rising of anti-Asian views um, moving up from October 2019 into March 2020 as, um, and you might all recall, March 2020 is really when um, the pandemic really hit the nation um, you know, across the board and you start to see the shutdown of businesses, schools, um, public institutions, et cetera. And you can see that you know, all Americans you, is, is the gray bar here rose in terms of 14%. Um, and then, you know, Republicans are certainly a little bit higher, but the Democrats are at 12%. So, you know, all rising from eight, nine, 8%, 9%, and 11%. So you can see these increases creeping up. And unfortunately, um, these backlashes, um, this sort of constant uh, attention to the media, the constant linking of the disease with people from China or Asian Americans more broadly, um, has led to really um, a great deal of animosity and, and, and um, stress and attacks on Asian Americans. And this is going back to the previous slide here. This was from June 2020. This was a report that was done by the Pacific Policy and Planning Council. And um, they had done a study across about 13 weeks um, earlier in 2020 and noticed that there were over 800 COVID-19 related hate incidents against Asian Americans just taking place in the state of California. So this is a report that you can actually find on their website. And so these sorts of things have been incredibly um, frustrating, incredibly difficult to read about, and certainly very difficult to watch on social media in terms of those viral videos. So unfortunately, um, we have seen um, not an end, but instead kind of a continuation of some of the, the, the violence that this report noted in early 2020, um, still with us in 2021. So let me move ahead here. So those kinds of the concerns really led to the Asia Pacific Planning and Policy Council to create the Stop AAPI Hate. Dot org website. The, here, the idea was that 
there was a the Asian American Policy and Planning Council based in California, um, along with um, others, decided that it was very important to launch this kind of website to really start to track um, um, the rise in hate crimes. And so the, uh, Asia, the Planning Council, along with the Chinese for Affirmative Action, San Francisco State University's Asian American Studies Department, so these are all um, the, the groups that are involved in terms of creating this website to really capture um, what they saw as an alarming incidence of hate crimes um, or expressions of hate directed toward Asian Americans. And some of them are quite mundane from people just sort of, you know, taking a walk, going shopping um, and hearing racial epithets yelled at them all the way to um, something much, much more serious to actual uh, attacks, physical uh, attacks that cause bodily harm. And you can see the website here is um, using different, is making itself available in different languages, different Asian languages, because the concern also isn't just the rise in these incidents, but just that there hasn't been a great mechanism for capturing what has been happening. And certainly language has been a barrier, um, unfamiliarity with the police and process the procedures for police reporting, these are all some of the concerns that uh, people have had in terms of how to address these crimes. And, uh, and so you can certainly, I put the, um, uh, the web address, so you can certainly go on there and, um, and look at some of the reports that they have done and certainly see just um, the efforts that have gone into trying to track and hopefully stop an address um, the rise of hate crimes. So I want to shift now into thinking about this more historically. So now that I've given you a picture of what has been going on presently, I think it's important to understand that this is not something that is just simply about the COVID-19 pandemic. Certainly the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of opening up all sorts of concerns, all sorts of worries, um, you know, is, is, is very real and we're experiencing that every day in our lives. But that alone cannot explain this um, immediate um, connection or why it seems so easy to connect or scapegoat Asian Americans, um, particularly Chinese Americans in, in terms of this disease. So to really understand that, I think we have to think more historically. We have to really go into Asian American history. We have to really think about how these histories of race and disease have been present for quite some time in American history. So to do that, I wanna give one specific example. So I want us to think about the, the 1900 bubonic plague pandemic, um, which I know the media has reported on to some degree as a sort of another parallel. Um, though more, I think the media has focused on the 1918 influenza epidemic but, but really for the purposes, I think, for understanding anti-Asian violence related to race and disease, we have to go a little bit earlier and think about the 1900 bubonic plague pandemic. So that particular pandemic arose um, in Asia, across the Pacific, and you can see its impact on the real life experiences of Chinese in the US at the time. Uh, and much of it was, uh, so it's important to remember that in, in the period of 1900, um, we are still very much in the era of Chinese exclusion. So the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed in 1882, um, renewed every 10 years, and then into perpetuity in 1904. So in 1900, it had just been renewed um, in 1892 by the Geary Act, and the sense there was the banning of Chinese laborers for a period of 10 years from migrating to the US. So already the nation was clearly hostile, anti-Chinese, um, and that is sort of the context that we have to think about when we consider the arrival of the bubonic plague pandemic um, into um, the West Coast. So before we get into Honolulu, I just wanna sort of explain very quickly. So on March 6, 1900, San Francisco public health officials made the very unsettling discovery that a Chinese worker residing in Chinatown of San Francisco had died of the bubonic plague. 
Immediately, San Francisco public officials went into action. They quarantined the Chinatown neighborhood and basically um, created a situation. Here, I can move up. Oops. Yeah, and this is what you're seeing. So this is San Francisco. So public officials quarantined the Chinatown neighborhood. And basically at the time, um, germ theory was known because we're talking about 1900, but there was still the sense of perhaps Chinese bodies were diseased or naturally diseased. And the notion there was that if Chinese bodies were naturally diseased, Chinese homes, Chinese neighborhoods were therefore also diseased. So it was important to contain the spaces um, inhabited by Chinese immigrants, whether these be places of work, places of, of, of um, residence, uh, places of worship, all of these places had to be contained. And at the time in San Francisco, um, the imagination there was that Chinese were safely contained already in Chinatown in these, in these few blocks, but what ended up happening was the belief that like, we had to truly contain a neighborhood with armed guards, barricade, and you see a barbed wire barricade here. So that the quarantine of the neighborhood was both logical and necessary. And part of this, and this is where we can go back to Hawaii here. So part of this was simply because the, the plague had made its way to Honolulu before it, it stopped, um, came, it basically came via um, steamships. So it stopped in Honolulu earlier in 1899 and then made its way to, Cal uh, to California, to San Francisco in 1900. So there in June and December of 1899, officials in Honolulu found cases of bubonic plague on board a ship coming from Asia and also in the Chinatown neighborhood of Honolulu. Hawaii, then the Republic of Hawaii quickly called for a state of emergency and granted full control um, of the island to the Board of Health in, the order, in order to contain the threat of the bubonic plague. Public health officials quickly put into motion a quarantine of Chinatown. So you can see there's that rope in this picture of holding people back. Um, they cordon off the area. They uh, basically deputize voluntary guards and to really keep people contained. And the aim was, if you contain the people, you contain the disease. Um, but what happened next was that they decided containing and just waiting for the disease to end, uh, you know, its, its cycle was not going to be enough. And instead they decided it was important to do a controlled burn of the buildings in Honolulu. And the hope there was that by burning the buildings, uh, they would be able to eradicate the disease once and for all. So there, as you can see from this picture, um, that happened in January of, of 1900. And then very quickly, you, you, you can probably tell from the, the smoke in the background, the cloud of the massive cloud of smoke in the background, is that what had started as, as a simple control burn of a few buildings, particularly the buildings where um, the, the, uh, the disease, the bubonic plague was first detected, the, the initial aim was to burn just those buildings, and, but quickly um, came, became out of control as a result of high, unexpected high winds. So the wind shifted and gusted, and before city officials could really do anything about it, the fire was out of control. So not only was Chinatown burned to the ground, but nearly a fifth of Honolulu was also burned to the ground within a matter of hours. And to give you a sense of how large the scale of destruction was, um, the hot, this particular Honolulu fire of 1900 became a major man-made civic disaster. Um, and it was actually the largest man-made disaster in Hawaii history until the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December, 1941. So that's how significant that fire ended up being. So the news of the plague and, and particularly how badly it went in Honolulu um, was, you know, was something that public health officials all over the continent um, in, in North America uh, read very carefully, followed that news. And as the, as the, the bubonic plague pandemic crossed the Pacific, 
uh, public health officials were ready to spring into action to decide what to do. So back to San Francisco. They knew they, they knew they wanted to do the quarantine in the same way, and they, and they were even more strict, as you can sort of see with the barbed wire barricade. They didn't just use voluntary guards, but used police um, and actual um, uh, armed, armed police to make sure to enforce the barricade. Um, but they did not do a control burn. Yet, what is curious and which really tells us a lot about this linking of race and disease is what San Francisco public health officials authorized was that they allowed whites to enter and leave the neighborhood, but maintained the barricade against Chinese people. In other words, the thought was if disease was linked to Chinese bodies, those were the people you had to contain and prevent from moving around the city. But whites, assuming were assumed to not have disease bodies in the same way were allowed to leave the neighborhood and move through the city of San Francisco. So you see this cordon off, people were not allowed to go in and out um, if one was Chinese, um, but whites would be allowed to leave. Mobility, though heavily restricted because of the quarantine, still became a matter of white racial privilege in this moment. So as this process of quarantine suggests, public officials authority to mark and set off one part of the city from another work to create new meanings to the spaces people inhabited. And so the plague and this kind of marking off, I think did you know, a lot to really emphasize that these blocks are where the Chinese belong. They don't really belong anywhere else in the city. So as a result, even after the barbed wire barricades were gone after the plague was over, it still kind of seemed to be solidified as the sort of borders of the community. Another way that this notion of race and disease came to be more cemented was also through graphics and certainly through the media. For example, Harper's Weekly, a very popular publication in the period throughout the 19th and early 20th century, um, depicted uh, Chinese often. And in this particular case, this was specifically about the plague. And you can see here, this is from June 2nd, 1900. This is supposed to be during uh, a depiction of the Chinese confined within the Chinese quarter. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see the caption really well, but it says here, the bubonic plague in San Francisco, Chinamen confined within the Chinese quarter, cooking their meals. So here's the thing. If you look at this image very carefully, you can see that it's not, it's not neutral. The, the Chinese figures are bathed in shadow. Um, their images so seem somewhat mysterious, even demonic in terms of the kind of shadow faces that, that emerge. So it's certainly suggesting that Chinese people um, embody this disease and may even be morally diseased. So not just physically, but morally diseased. So Chinatown wasn't simply the place where Chinese resided or worked um, or cooked their meals, but came to represent a kind of public health menace as well as a moral menace to San Franciscans. Again, it's important to think about this in the context of Chinese exclusion. So Chinese exclusion came about out of the belief that Chinese laborers were unfit for inclusion into American society. And so these images basically reinforce those uh, understandings by painting the images of Chinese as diseased, both physically and morally. So this naturalizing of disease in Chinese bodies and places of work and residence then had this very real material consequence that worked to segregate Chinatown from the rest of San Francisco and certainly to mark the Chinese as other, as separate, and should not be included. Because to be included could have dire social, moral, health consequences. So this separation in turn, I think, dramatically shaped the lives of Chinese immigrants in that city. So it's not just some sort of harmless image at all, but it, it helped to support policies of exclusion, of the quarantine, um, of the lack of aid going into that community, for example, is seen as not quite deserving. 
Um, they weren't true Americans, in other words. So it's important to consider how these narratives of race and disease had great power, even if it's not accurate, because certainly we know um, that disease doesn't naturally reside in Chinese bodies. And, and it really was not a good public health decision to let whites enter and leave, but only um, slow down or stop the movement of Chinese. And more importantly, I think we see how it really legitimizes the use of state power or the abuse of state power um, in the containment of Chinese people in this period. So I hope this example gives you a sense of just how old that notion of Chinese uh, people linked to race, disease. And this does not only stay with Chinese people, but, it, but as other Asian groups migrate throughout the 20th century into the United States, those concerns of moral contagion, physical disease, et cetera, are also um, something that come to also taint other Asian immigrant groups as well. So coming back to 2020, we're no longer obviously in the era of Asian exclusion, thankfully, and Asian Americans are in a completely different place, um, socially, economically, politically, legally. Um, you know, the, all, many, many changes have happened obviously since 1900. Asian Americans are more economically and politically successful and powerful than they've ever been before. And certainly, the last few decades, we've seen a lot of mobilization against racism, against Asian Americans, and the move for, um, for rights, opportunities, these things have really changed the landscape of Asian American opportunity. So we are in a very different place. So unlike the 1900s, when Chinese had a very difficult time pushing back against these racist policies, in 2020, this is very different. We have social media. Um, some of you may remember this, when um, this was last summer, when you see co Congress members, um, as well as um, the Screen Actors Guild, um, really coming together and really talking about the importance of demanding justice, um, ending anti-Asian violence, COVID-19 racism, et cetera. So for example, and we're, I'm not going to play this video, but um, a number of prominent Asian American actors uh, got together. You can sort of see some of them in this frame, Ken Jeong, Lucy Liu, um, and others, who um, basically worked together and released this PSA, um, urging the public to, quote, stand against the stigma, xenophobia, and harassment related to COVID-19 that Asian Americans continue to experience. So in Congress, um, a bipartisan group led by Republican Ted Lieu, a Democrat in California, um, demanding Attorney General William Barr to publicly condemn attacks uh, targeting Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, as well as to provide constant status updates um, on the steps that the Department of Justice was taking to combat acts of anti-Asian bias. So you see, um, congressional leaders, you know, pushing for action. And then you see um, Asian American actors taking a public stand and trying to raise consciousness to really try to get the public to, to really think about um, the harm that the pandemic had done to Asian American communities. So Lou's demand, I think, makes clear um, that it was also important at the same time as a political leader to still carve out a space to criticize the People's Republic of China, um, and the particular the Chinese government in terms of how they're handling of the virus and, and information, um, that that space was still necessary for issues of, of fighting the pandemic, um, for, uh, for international diplomacy, et cetera, that that space still needed to be there, but that should be understood as different from racializing the disease and fanning hatred. So these needed to be uncoupled. So these efforts are, have all been important as well as other efforts 
um, for calling attention to Asian American bias and violence and calling for an end to xenophobia. But I guess it's been unclear how effective these efforts have been. So because these particular, these two particular efforts as I described were from last summer. So in July, 2020, and certainly as I began today's talk, the last four weeks have seen an uptick um, in really just these reprehensible, very public um, um, acts of anti-Asian violence. So it's very unclear how, how these efforts have really led to the kind of changes that people are pushing for. So to conclude, um, I want us to think about just how difficult it is to, to move forward, especially in this moment where the racial reckoning and the pandemic are intersecting at the same time. That is that, that it can be, I think, I wouldn't say easy, but I think it could be um, too simple to just lock into this issue of anti-Asian violence and doing whatever it takes to protect our communities that in some ways leaves us out of the conversation of other modes of social justice that are just as important and affect Asian American communities as well. So in other words, I think there's a real challenge that Asian American communities are facing today in terms of how to create and mobilize a social justice vision that is not just about protecting Asian Americans and Asian American communities, but really interested in broad coalitions and that really fight for social justice for all, especially for poor, low-income, um, non-white communities in the United States. Because one of the things that I think um, we were seeing in the media after these crimes, those, these most recent crimes, was the sense that allyship had somehow failed us, that it was important to take care of our own, protect our own, um, call for police action. And I think as horrific as these crimes have been, that it's not right to, I think, abandon this broader social justice vision yet. Uh, and I hope we never do, honestly, because the importance of making real change, systemic change that would, that would be a benefit to all of us, I think is still very real and very possible. Um, and so it's important, I think, to really think this through very much. So even though we're no longer in the exclusion era, the present day concerns of race and disease or race and criminal justice are shared by all groups of color with histories of exclusion and racial segregation in the United States. That is, it's important to, to not just be stuck in the space of wanting to protect and think about security and nothing else, but instead really be able to think about how are we asking um, for social justice? How are we making social justice happen? So for example, one thing that I would want us to see more of is to broaden the conversation of Asian Americans in the pandemic um, beyond this, these issues of hate crimes and discrimination. Or, or, so what I mean by that is not to say that we're, these are not important, these are absolutely important issues, but they're not the only issues. They, hate crimes have always been extremely um, spectacular in terms of grabbing our attention from the media, but sometimes it takes attention away from some equally important and compelling issues. So for example, um, data compiled by the Los Angeles Times, for example, have shown that pre-existing health conditions and occupational hazards are among the factors that contribute to the high numbers of Filipino American deaths during the pandemic. So beyond the horrific news of violence on the streets, um, we need to pay just as much attention to what the pandemic is doing to, the community, to our communities in terms of people um, getting ill, not getting adequate treatment and dying um, because of pre-existing conditions or because their work has put them in a state of precarity. So the Los Angeles Times reported that many of those who died were older than 60 and many had diabetes and hypertension. Many were retired, living in multi-generational multi housing with their children or were um, in nursing homes. And then some were younger victims working essential jobs. That is, they were on the front lines of, of healthcare as nurses, as orderlies, 
um, as physician, physician assistants, or they were working in law enforcement, or they were in working in, um, in the service sector, in grocery stores or restaurants. So this is another aspect of social justice, racial justice, that has to be um, really reckoned with as well, that we have to think about the, how the ways in which the pandemic has also wrought havoc um, on working class, Asian American communities, and certainly communities that have a high proportion in the healthcare industry, such as Filipino Americans. Moreover, beyond this issue of healthcare injustices, I think we also have to think about policing um, just as much in terms of also police violence in our communities. That is, Asian Americans have also really had to contend with police violence in uh, particularly new immigrant working class poor communities in much the same way as other um, inner city communities have had to do so. But I think, unfortunately, the media tends to not focus on those issues at all, but instead more high profile issues have been um, this one, in particular, the case of um, the shooting of Akai Gurley and, and the prosecution of Officer Peter Liang. Um, this, is a, this is a case in New York City that happened in 2016, that this was more of a high profile case that than perhaps the incidences of um, police violence against Asian Americans. Instead, this particular case, um, Peter Li Officer Peter Liang received five years probation and 800 hours of community service for fatally shooting um, a Kai Gurley um, in a public housing project. And the, the sentence was just reduced to criminally negligent homicide. And this created a, an out, um, you know, an outpouring of of anguish among African-American uh, activists and community members in New York City. And it unfortunately suggests that somehow Asian-Americans are, are not affected by this. And this is not, not true in the least. Um, so one of the things that, off, that is rarely discussed in the media is just how much Asian-Americans um, are actually impacted by the prison system in the United States. During the prison boom of the 1990s, for example, the API prisoner population grew by 250%. During this time, Asian juveniles in California were more than twice as likely to be tried as adults as compared to white juveniles who committed similar crimes. And if we think about deportation, this is yet another form of uh, punishment in terms of state disciplining and punishment perhaps that is in some ways just as difficult and brutal as incarceration in some ways. Deportation soared after 1996 when Congress passed the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, EDPA, and the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. Um, so though the passage of those in 1996 opened up the use of deportation against um, many Asian immigrant communities in the United States. Non-citizens could be deported for certain crimes, even if they were committed before the passage of the law. And again, like these, this is not reported very often. And currently there's an estimation of about 14,000 families living in limbo, waiting on deportation sentence to be carried out. So these and other issues, um, don't get nearly as much attention as the Harvard Affirmative Action case, for example. And this is the other thing that I will just probably close with, is that instead we often don't necessarily see social justice, um, these intersections of social justice fights with other communities of color um, because of the ongoing proliferation of that model minority stereotype that Asian Americans seem to fall into over and over again in the media. So the Harvard Affirmative Action case, um, for example, or the news of Yale emissions, for example, um, and Asian Americans take up much more media time. You will see much more reporting about those cases than anything about Southeast Asian refugees and de deportation.
and the criminal justice system. And these are the things that I think that it's actually just as important as the concerns about anti-Asian violence in the pandemic era that we need to be thinking through. So I will stop here. And I hope this um, lecture in terms of Asian American history has helped us to think a little bit more about race, disease, and social justice. Thank you. <laughs>